Lakshmi, Masanta Morakale, we love a quarry.
హలో హలో ఎవరిబడి ఒక్క నిమిషం ప్రజెంట్ ఇట్ నా యువర్ ఎంటైర్ స్క్రీన్ లవ్ చేస్తున్నా చేస్తున్నా ప్రజెంటింగ్ యువర్ స్క్రీన్ కెన్ సీ ఇట్ నా హలో అనిల్ కెన్ యూ సీ ఇట్ అండ్ కెన్ యూ ఓకే ఓకే షూర్ షూర్ చెప్పండి అని చెప్తుంది ఆల్రెడీ సో యూ కెన్ హియర్ మీ రైట్ ఒక్క నిమిషం నేను లెట్ మీ టర్న్ ఆఫ్ మొబైల్ అండ్ దెన్ సే సంథింగ్ Can you hear me, Anil? Hello, Anil, can you hear me? Hello? Hello, Anil? హలో అనిల్ కెన్ యూ హియర్ మీ హలో హలో అనిల్ చెప్పు అనిల్ ఓకే ఓకే గుడ్ గుడ్ సో వాట్ వీ డూ ఐ మీన్ ఐ వెయిట్ టిల్ లెవెన్ ఓకే టెన్ ఫిఫ్టీ ఫైవ్ మేబీ ఆర్ టూ మినిట్స్ బిఫోర్ ఐ విల్ స్టార్ట్ డూయింగ్ సమ్ చిట్ చాట్ అండ్ దెన్ ఐ విల్ షాప్ లీ
the things to Sir Panil, sir, please go ahead, sir. 1053, start your event, huh? No, no, sir, you can start, sir. Start with the joint. Huh? Please start your event, sir. Okay, okay. Thank you, thank you, sir. Okay. Hello, and good morning to everybody. The topic for today's webinar is uh, probabilistic data structures. So thanks to Sri Venkatesa Perumal College uh, Engineering and Technology uh, for providing me this opportunity. Myself Venkata Babji, uh, I hold MTech degree in Computer Science and Engineering from Central University Pondicherry. I've been in the industry for close to 19 years. Prior to that, I uh, worked as a faculty and uh, uh, as a research associate in uh, research institutions. So I thought offering a glimpse of uh, probabilistic data structures could be useful. Uh, the moment I saw the uh, planned uh, intended audience covering a wide spectrum of people ranging from students, I'm sure students of uh, different years, maybe adjoining along with faculty, research scholars and uh, probably some people from uh, industry. It's been a bit of challenge for me to uh, come up with a presentation to cover uh, such a wide audience. So excuse me if I'm missing out something or my best effort was put to ensure uh, we don't go in depth Okay, we'll, the, the primary goal of this presentation is to briefly touch upon uh, some of these concepts and I'm sure uh, each of you uh, are curious, curious and talented enough to explore it further. With that, let's get started. This is the uh, agenda for today's uh, session. This is how we're going to run. Uh, we may uh, go in different slightly different order here and there but more or less these are the high level concepts and this is how the presentation is being organized so first we'll start with refreshing our memories on certain fundamentals no rocket science but we tend to uh, uh, forget some of them or uh, the recollecting them quickly uh, goes a long way in in grasping some uh, new uh, techniques so we will also touch upon some specific problems we will not go uh, with an open ended uh, uh, introduction to probabilistic data structures that way probably we can relate to and make more sense out of it so those problems primarily are membership counting cardinality those are the not those are the just a subset of the problems that probabilistic data structures addresses and are being widely used in the industry and academia but we'll start with those 
uh, you will be able to find out your uh, uh, path from there onwards that was my thought okay and of course uh, as a solution to those problems uh, we will introduce probabilistic data structures some of you might already know it great if somebody doesn't know hope it, the, the session would benefit you so the scope is strictly limited to just a glimpse going in depth requires a focused set of audience uh, as well as a lot of time which is that's the reason that is not being planned maybe some other time we can choose to go slightly deeper if there is an opportunity this is the context to uh, i would like to set up why are we interested in these problems why did i pick those problems or why did i pick these uh, probabilistic data structures so why are they going to be useful these are not new problems these are century old problems maybe couple of centuries most of these problems have been uh, exposed to kids in uh, school mathematics itself directly or indirectly uh, most of us do it in daily life but the only trick is when the volumes go up crazily that's what uh, typically we say at an internet scale things are too big at internet scale they don't deal with hundreds thousands or not even millions the internet scale problems are typically dealing with billions okay just the volume wouldn't speak it, it wouldn't be uh, representative the industry and academia has uh, done very good job and it's very well understood we know how to deal with the billions trillions of data points in an oltp that is a batch process but with the exploration i mean with the explosion of the internet the batch processing is not very useful at times okay we will touch upon briefly uh, why that is the case when we expose a service to internet so there are few characteristics for the data most of you might be familiar i mean you must have heard this in uh, it's a famous uh, uh, insight that the data is characterized by volume velocity and variety essentially what it means is volumes could be billions of billions of data points running into terabytes or petabytes okay volume by itself doesn't justify of course even if you keep capturing what you do every day at, at a very detail for example you keep capturing a video at a very high resolution even you can uh, or each of us can uh, pile up few terabytes of data in no time but that doesn't uh, that alone is not what characterizes the challenges with data so second thing is the speed of change that is what we call velocity trends change okay so for instance we all uh, are familiar with uh, sale seasons uh, hosted by popular e-commerce amazon flipkart and someone else someone launches uh, a sale season and uh, in in 5 minutes the demand spikes up and competitor also starts with that and then demand starts some of them start going there okay so at that moment when millions of people are already hitting it makes sense for the service provider to be able to understand what's going on and instantly respond to that if we say okay i collect the data and a week later i will analyze the user is not going to wait they'll go to the alternative vendor okay so a lot of i mean millions of millions of dollars are uh, uh, are into uh, or are at stake uh, with respect to dealing with the velocity of the data variety again uh, depends on the context uh, if you are only doing uh, let us suppose again e-commerce then itself the variety is humongous i mean quite often we underestimate the people coming from different browsers the people coming from different mobiles the people coming from different versions of the operating system people coming from different internet isps people coming for of i mean from different age groups different uh, buying habits different goods of interest a lot okay all of these dimensions put together when combined with large volumes and velocity pose a humongous challenge okay as our job is to mostly model and solve uh, data related problems that's one of the problem we primarily deal with in computer science we should understand and appreciate that volume velocity variety even if something else is there 
each of them by themselves is not a challenge we very well understand how to deal with it but when they come together is when the challenge becomes very hard we will briefly uh, discuss those things okay so that's what typically when we say internet scale the amounts of data and velocity variety of data is crazy okay or we say it's it's very large uh, scale then many of you must have already been familiar with iot there is a proliferation of uh, devices that are connected uh, either in an internet or in a private network off late whether it is mobile wristwatch headphone washing machine tv computer itself laptop desktop every device is being embedded with the tcp stack given an identity and and they are now interacting with the back end servers for various reasons okay and second phenomena that is worth paying attention is the content sharing there is a clear change in that pattern and trend okay there are many uh, social uh, media websites uh, that are quite popular and there are many mobile apps that have made clicking a photo or clicking a video and sharing possible instantly okay so so that means all the people along with the devices not only people if there is a washing machine it is constantly whenever you turn it on it's constantly sending data there are various reasons why it does that okay so the content sharing has has grown significantly of late so that obviously poses a major challenge and again the content is of different types as we know somebody is exchanging text twitter there is twitter and somebody is exchanging photos somebody is exchanging video somebody is exchanging documents if we imagine putting together a system that can listen on to this traffic being exchanged and make some sense out of it it's going to be a marathon just due to the sheer volume velocity and variety itself can give us an idea of what it takes okay so we will be touching upon these use cases like e-commerce uh, the reasons why we would want to monitor trends or insights in real time as i said you collect the data and, and crunch it uh, a week later a month later yes that's how the world has been but that's not very interesting all the times people would want to know the data in at fingertips instantly we call we don't call it real time as such it's not like real time in an operating system it's not that uh, low level latencies mm -hmm. typically it is uh, near real time near real time could be defined by use case to use case if you are having a shopping cart near real time could be few minutes or if you are doing something else near real time could be few seconds so it, it it it's defined by use case but net net as the data is streaming in it's not like store and crunch as the data is streaming in people would want to extract certain in, insights okay so you may have heard about a term called stream processing that's that's precisely what uh, the 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 league it gets into okay then content delivery network the amount of data that is getting on to internet is as you know it's huge okay how would you deliver that network people don't want to just hold the data on uh, on back end servers so people would want to share them among the services among organizations with people it's it's all over the map okay and of course we'll also briefly touch upon security aspects the moment we are getting online we are getting exposed to all kinds of crazy people we don't know their intents we don't know their capabilities we think okay it's i am i am safe but the the guy on the other end might be a very skilled attacker right so there are a lot of systems put in place in internet itself but today we will try try to touch upon briefly on the endpoint security just as a use case to understand how the 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 data impacts trivial things uh, become very complicated and challenging these are few examples i pulled from yesterday night so apparently digital population of india as of jan 2020 has grown to close to 700 million okay so i i was having a difficulty counting without putting comma in for zeros okay so these are crazy numbers okay so just let us imagine someone has a social media application and or let us say uh, you you captured a beautiful video and you shared it it's like color verity kind of stuff let us suppose yes, at least let us say it is 100 mb video file 
they pick up they pick up uh, uh, trends uh, you don't know when you throw something at the internet uh, everybody who likes it why they like it you, you never know so we we do keep hearing something like uh, viral okay so when something all of a sudden picks up demand in numbers of millions then we say that it is viral let us suppose a video was uploaded and it was viral that means everybody is trying to access it just a 100 mb file if there are 1 million people who try to access it that essentially means from the source if you don't do anything sophisticated you will have to stream close to 90760 gb i would have thought of taking a, a static ip from my isp maybe one and a half decade back putting my video and sharing the link with my friends but we know that that is not possible my ISP or not my machine can ever serve so much of data and 1 billion hits is not like over a month it can happen even in a day right so when it comes to security just to get a glimpse of how crazy the problem becomes let us right now I again pulled the uh, stats from yesterday night apparently there are these many unique URLs okay recognized as malicious they have already been categorized people know that these set of urls are malicious danger don't ever go there so when we know something is danger obviously you would want to maintain that list on the stop if an endpoint whether it is mobile laptop desktop doesn't matter what it is you, you would never want to go there unless you want to go and mess with them right so how do we do that let us suppose it is as simple as it let's suppose you got a hold of all this data let's suppose it's publicly available most of the times it is and now you would like to write a uh, antivirus system where let us suppose you hooked into the networking stack of the system and anytime there is an outbound connection to these urls you would want to block just imagine so keeping this much data in a file okay so is crazy okay you will not be able to hold so much of data in memory let alone looking it up at real time the moment you hit most of us hit close to 500 to 600 urls a day when we are doing some study or research every time looking through all these urls and unblocking or unblocking is uh, is not going to happen if you want just to try it out just generate few billions of grids and then using whatever program and data structure you want and try to search it and figure out how long it's going to take okay so these are the kind of problems basic problems it, it, it's it's not rocket science we have just set of data points we would like to look into it look into it most of the people who have started programming a uh, few months down the line will 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 uh, write programs to solve these kind of problems but the same very same problem becomes a major challenge when the data is at internet scale okay Imagine even if you manage to put very efficient system to uh, to look it up, there are a million new URLs coming up every week. You will have to keep refreshing the endpoints. All the time you will be exchanging data and refreshing the endpoints. So it's not going to go anywhere. There are theoretical limits. So that's the reason any program may start with that, but when you release it, it's going to fail. Okay. So it's so that's the reason it's important to understand the impact of volume and speed and variety of the data when we try to build practical products especially at internet scale okay so those were the examples and or i would say use cases now let us say we will go over the formalization of some basic problems let's forget about the e-commerce amazon flickpop or whatever let us get back to our basic how do we tackle with this we can't directly solve amazon's problem so we will break it down into basic uh, problems and then we attack them okay so these are few basic problems these are not the only problems that we need to deal with when we are building uh, internet scale product but i picked these because it's easy to discuss over uh, webinar especially for beginners okay membership frequency cardinality okay the terms might sound crazy or, or fancy but they don't really mean huge thing membership means given an element and let us suppose we have a data set we would like to see whether it is there in the data set or not like the example like you have set of urls given a url we would want to see whether it is there in the list or not as simple as it. Okay. frequency frequency is nothing but counting the number of items an element is 
recurring in the data set okay so let us suppose something is it's, it's, it's a use case like a particular customer is coming and buying again and again so you would want to know how many times a particular customer has come or you would want to know who is the uh, the set of customers that most frequently visit the system not only customers other systems or whatever so this is nothing but a counting problem when you have uh, a list of uh, elements you would want to keep maintain a count obviously you don't want to go search through the entire list every time you ask for count of a specific thing because we know that is going to be very expensive cardinality again is nothing but the total number of distinct elements in a data set let us suppose i have uh, a set like one two three one four five okay so the total i mean individual number of elements might be more but the distinct elements are one two three four five only five that is what we call as cardinality so these are the problems we will be tackling today membership frequency and cardinality again i must caution you we will not go into the depths the jungle is very dense there okay so before we go and try to attack those problems so let us refresh our memory about few fundamental concepts okay just to feel comfortable about it then let us just pull it into our l2 cache so that we can catch okay so most of us are familiar with these kind of uh, uh, terminology set map hash probably if if someone is not from computer science or early in their uh, academia maybe they haven't heard about hash we will touch upon that probability is very important the probabilistic data uh, structures are founded by strong probability theory also the results are probabilistic they are not going to be certain okay so there is a chance of uncertainty say, there that's the reason they are called probably probability data structures but cautiously i avoided going deep into the probability at this uh, for this uh, presentation because we don't need much of in depth unless we would want to go uh, investigate further uh, nitty gritties of the data structures we should be i mean we should be able to find and manage with just those three concepts let us briefly touch upon set we all know just to refresh memory it's not to teach i mean all of us would know mostly just to refresh our memory some terminology and uh, the basic concept set is nothing but a collection of distinct objects it could be one three five seven nine or a e i o u or or sometimes we can also say it's, it's a set of all uh, mobile numbers this is how we this is annotation that we use or all the ipv4 addresses or all other numbers let's pay attention to the word distinctness okay set in a set you cannot repeat and repeat an element okay that is called a multi set a set by default means one element is present only once this is unique set okay or a collection of distinct objects a subset is a is a family concept to all of us when uh, when we take two sets and if every element in one set is also there in the other set we say that the, the first sub is, is a subset of the the later one or the other way we also say that the later is a superset of p depending on whether it is uh, fully included or can be equal we say proper subset or proper superset doesn't matter i mean this is a uh, very famous uh, uh, observation from the uh, number theory uh, which can remind us what subset means okay and there are bunch of operations that we are familiar on with respect to sets cardinality as we touched upon it is nothing but the distinct number of elements in a given set and then union is nothing but you you mix both of them intersection is you find the the elements that are common in both if there is an element in a and b then you say that that is intersection okay complement is is kind of uh, subtraction so here the example shows that this is a, a complement of b into a okay and then of course just to uh, make it complete i mean we, we will also be have studied cartesian product where we multiply things and and it's a, it's a combinatorial operation okay so the obviously there is no venn diagram for cartesian product or cardinality uh, okay so now let us briefly touch upon what a map is okay it's a synonym that we use to represent a function or morphism function is, is an easy concept to understand we would have uh, dealt with a lot of functions in in programming or in mathematics a lot of times morphism is a, a bit uh, deep uh, theoretical uh, 
uh, term in coming from the core algebra you can consider morphism as as, as a morphing okay which we, we are most of us are familiar i mean some some object is morphed into some other object okay it is the actual same object but it just takes a different shape that is what we call as morphism and that's also we often refer to that also as a map and the terminology we use is f colon domain range so what it means is some elements in the domain are mapped onto the range just as an example square let us suppose square if we call it as a map function or morphism if 2 is fed into the function 2 the, the function square it maps that 2 to 4 2 into 2 so that's the square right at the same time if you if let us suppose there is another mapping or function square root if you feed 4 as an input into it it's going to result it in 2 in mathematics we don't try to use this most of uh, the in lot of uh, english language we say that 2 is mapped to 4 or 4 is mapped to 2 in this particular case they happen to be inverse okay so square and uh, square root happens to be in, uh, inverse but let us uh, remind that that's not always the case okay so so that's the reason we need to pay attention to direction if two uh, two maps to four it doesn't mean four maps to two and again there is another dimension to maps uh, depending on how they translate uh, there are one to one one to many many to one many to many as you might be familiar i just put them together to refresh our memory okay so now let's get into hash this is something that some of you not sure uh, especially if, if you have come from other streams of engineering that have not had a lot of credits in computer science and etc there's nothing this is again a mathematical concept but unlikely you would have spent uh, much time on investigating it hash is consider it as a function that's the reason we introduced maps consider it as a function okay so you feed some data why it is a specific i mean why we emphasize on hash is it can take data of arbitrary size arbitrary entropy or arbitrary cardinality and then map it onto a range which is much smaller than the domain so just as an example a b c d all, all the way to z we have 26 alphabets here whereas it is mapping those to the right side the right side is what we call as range it's a three bit number three bit number can only have there can only be eight different numbers starting from zero to seven right so it's quite evident that when there is such a function which is mapping from a larger set onto a smaller set the effect is this some of the elements on the left side get mapped to a same element on the right side right so this is called a collision okay and also let us pay attention that hash functions are typically one way and many to one and most of the time range it's not necessary that all functions do that but range is a fixed size here in this case we picked a three bit number okay so this is about uh, a hash function as simple as it it's not a big thing now so now let us delve into the problems okay so just as a reminder these are the problems that we agreed to uh, deal with and now uh, internet scale we should always keep that in mind i mean membership frequency cardinality these are fundamental problems basic problems we have all dealt with in our school college or for that matter even in daily life even a fruit vendor knows or whether a fruit should be put in a uh, should, in which basket depending on the type of the fruit or or the size of the fruit right so frequency is again nothing but how many uh, apple do i have right so those are the kind of things in a in a mixed bag i mean you might say well, this has these many types of uh, fruits or sweets i mean we are familiar with sweet vendors who who sell mixed uh, bag of sweets so now let us dig a little deeper into the membership as we discussed we will not venture into the depths in state surface level okay so what how did we define it it's a problem for a data set uh, and the task is to decide whether some element belongs to the data set or not so it is an assumption that we are going to maintain a data set and there are queries going to in the nature of like given an element say whether it, it belongs to the member uh, the, the set or not that's the nature of it okay let us pay very carefully attention to what we are defining the membership as 
okay so let's suppose we start with a set s okay here i just uh, threw a simple set for a illustration purpose 192348865 that's that's it as simple as it so the queries are going to be like this okay given an x someone will ask is it a member of set if we say it is a member we say that x belongs to s if it is not a member we say that x does not belong to s okay so for illustration purpose one if somebody queries one given that set we say that yes one belongs to the set three belongs to the set whereas seven and ten do not belong to the set okay it's as simple as that we tend to uh, over engineer our, our over model solutions and that is what we need to stay away from at, at at the scale of internet anything extra that you do will penalize us or, or demand a huge cost okay that's the reason i am again and again saying the, the scope of the membership is just two aspects we should be able to add elements to the set and then we should be able to perform a test and say whether it is there in that set or not there is no business of retrieval nor delete let's be careful there is no delete operation here of course that's not how we do sets but that is where things very tough things become very uh, impossible very elegantly okay so why can't i just do a direct lookup let us suppose i i, I can go over the file and, and then do a lookup come on okay if you have a billion elements and are a trillion event elements and they are pouring in it's not like we maintain that in a database or somewhere they are pouring in as we speak and all, the, all of a sudden someone asks, have you seen this guy? Okay. And also, I mean, this is not the product, the solutions, the, 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 the e Amazon does not offer solution saying, did I see you before or not? That's not the solution that Amazon offers. So this is a tiny piece of information the guy needs to know before he can construct rest of the pipeline. He may decide he will take you to a specific place or offer certain uh, uh, discounts or certain things. Okay. So you have very little. Uh, amount of resources that you would want to spend on this test right so again going back to the set of urls let us suppose it's not even a hosted service we can of course hosted service uh, uh, there are uh, google as uh, hosted services where you can post a url and ask him whether it is good or not let us suppose if you want to embed that data set in, and, and package it into a client side uh, program okay so at this rate let us suppose if you just assume 128 bytes per url it's going to require you 52 gb okay of course 64 128 gb memories are common these days for servers but but for a desktop or for a mobile or for that matter for a wristwatch you don't have the luxury of having so much of memory and of course that's not the only thing that you do on that system right and lookup cost is obviously time wise it's going to be n log n because you need to even if you have optimized the org or organize the data for a faster lookup the actual space will further go up because you're not simply maintaining the data flat you have constructed a tree that demands more memory but let's give a chance i mean n log n is the time bound that we have so clearly a direct lookup is not a choice that we have it works for many cases uh, where the data is in, in, in reasonable sizes but they at an internet scale it's not going to work I have put together uh, simple programs where I would try uh, direct lookups using a simple set versus a sophisticated data structure and, and we can slightly discuss what are the impacts to just give a feel of it so this is the data structure so we are starting with the, the first data structure of interest the membership problem we have just figured out how hard it is at an internet scale right so bloom filter is a data structure don't worry about what is bloom or whatever the bloom is happens to be the the inventor's name okay so it's a filter because you are passing the data through it and it's going to help you right so bloom filter is a famous data structure that can address the membership with the constraints that we have been discussing I mean that the internet scale we cannot throw a lot of memory we cannot have huge latencies and it has to happen in real time okay these are things so that's the real time is, is something that comes from the velocity okay so how does 
if you want to implement a bloom filter or if you open up code of bloom filter how does it look very simple okay so at the bottom you have a bit array of size w it has w bits it's as simple as it it's not you don't need to deal with a lot of pointers for the basic version it's as simple as it okay but unlike our typical data structures where you get the data and you go create a node and put it here something else happens it doesn't go put the original value into the system or, or, or the array what it does is it will have a k number of hash functions there is special emphasis uh, uh, required when you select those hash functions uh, it's not like we cannot uh, select incompatible hash functions to be effective there is a lot of signs and uh, mathematics on what kind of uh, hashes are required uh, murmur hash is one of the famous hash and the bloom filter is nothing but just an XOR of uh, the result from all those hashes it's a map as we know hash is a map but we also know that it is a many to one map irreversible one so given a data element we pass it through n number of hash functions and the resulting data we simply just do an XOR and fill this bit array that's it it's as simple as it okay now it doesn't matter how many entries are coming in that unlike the set the memory footprint is not growing in here okay let us suppose you upfront decided that you would like to have a, a design a, a bloom filter to accommodate a billion okay so you would probably uh, be allocating memory because the bit array you will have to pick of suitable size to 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 satisfy certain characteristics but that's it uh, once you initialize it doesn't change i mean now you put 100 thousand a billion a million or even 10 billion it doesn't matter okay you keep it in cash keep doing it that's the luxury that the the probabilistic data structure and in particular the bloom filter offers so now let us dig a little deeper into it not into the math but uh, from a programming or understanding how it works or why it does what it does let us suppose i took x and what i need to do i need to do uh, hashing of i mean all hashes i need to compute all hashes of x let us suppose h0 resulted in uh, uh, setting this bit hk1 hk minus 1 is the last hash uh, uh, resulted in setting this bit and maybe something else also in between doesn't matter they could be zeros ones it doesn't matter just for an illustration sake what we do is you computed hash and as i said you just go xr or that essentially means you go set those bits it doesn't matter what other hash resulted it's the operation is as simple as it okay now let us suppose <coughs> y came okay. here we have already inserted x to the into the set remember we never wanted retrieval we only have two operations needed we should be able to insert an element into the set and we should be able to ask the data structure whether it is there or not insertion is as simple as it we are done with it now we'll ask the second question is it there okay let us suppose we ask the same question with an element y i just for the sake of clarity let us suppose we know that it's not x so it is a different element we know that it is not there in the set yet what's going to happen while testing we do exactly same as what we did insert except that we're not going to dirty the bitmap or we're not going to set instead what we do is we compute hashes and then do an xor and we xr that to see with the with the existing uh, the bit array to see what's going to happen okay and from here you see that let us suppose y resulted in a hash uh, hash h0 ended up setting bit one which was already set so that we wouldn't know whether it makes any difference or not but hk1 results in a different bit we know that it is not set that essentially means if y ever came into the stream that bit must have been set but that's not the case which essentially means that y was never seen okay it's a very elegant as simple as it but the math is deep in in terms of guaranteeing what it offers okay so the moment we see that the 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 xor of hashes not all of them are set we conclude that it's not present okay so the the membership is has two phases it's not symmetric okay so whether membership says whether an element is there or not there that is the trade-off that is the catch 
when an element is not there it is for sure it is certain that the element is not there the decimal structure will tell for sure that the element is not present in the set and here we we have seen why it says whatever it says and the confidence is 100% if it says it's not there it's not there it doesn't matter okay but let us suppose we put z we are testing whether an element z is there or not and and for the sake of clarity let us suppose we know that it is not x why we did not put we only tested x is the only thing that we put and this is the current state of the uh, data structure so it can so happen that the z when filtered through those many hashes and xr it can result in same exact bitmap which is already set it's possible the reason is we discussed about maps and hashes they are many to one okay many things can map to a single result it can so happen that z and hex put together have got have result in the same bitmap so now we come and see whether it is there it is there does it mean it's there no we cannot be sure if it is there we can say that yeah it is there but it, it need to be treated like maybe there this is not 100% certainty okay that is the catch why is such a crazy asymmetric test ever going to be useful yes it will definitely be useful okay so imagine imagine again i mean if uh, the url check uh, that we save browsing right so when we get hold of a, a, a url and we can do two checks we can say tell me whether it is there or not it possible that it may say it may be there so we block it or we ask him saying is it not there if data structure comes back and says no it is not there then that means the url is safe as far as the current dictionary is concerned what is it that we are caching in the client side program are those millions of millions of uh, urls that occupy are close to 70 50 mb no we are only going to keep just this bitmap how much is this going to occupy maybe few kbs or maybe few mbs that's it no, it's not going to run into gigs few kbs or mbs data will also fit into the cache l2 cache so it's not even going to go and hit the main memory for, let alone the disk so that is going to be super fast at the speed of the native cpu cycles so that is how all that we need is okay as long as it is not there i want to go there right we just a slice the question as as two sides of the coin and all of a sudden we found that a partial answer is also very useful okay if you want a sure shot answer can we do it of course we can do it but we need to deal with holding so much of data and it may take couple of minutes to even look through it but that is not the use case so there are use cases in the world where such partial answers are useful so this is what the bloom filter is about okay so when it says it's there it is maybe there when it says it's not there we say that it's not there for sure okay the algorithm wise if you look into it you may be surprised to see it is as simple as it it's just a different notation of saying what we have gone through and there are two operations as we said for a, for membership test we should be able to of course for practical reasons we should be able to add to the set this is what it is going to do it goes through all the k hashes generate the hashes and then of course when it says it is it's, it's an xr and then set that into the xr again with the blue field right so the second uh, the the interface for the the membership membership or blue filter is given an element how do i test same thing it's in a different words given this thing we are going to do exact same operation we'll go compute the hash and then this time like unlike the previous case we are not going to update the bitmap instead we are going to in memory just do an xor and see whether all the bits are set or not if all the bits are set then we say maybe if not if at least one of the bit is not set then we say that no it's not that right so this is how simple the code is going to look like no matter which programming language you pick of course what is under the hood of this bloom filter that might be slightly complicated and that's true even for a set right so those xrs the hashing functions all that magic happens inside this but from a interface design of the data structure wise it looks no different from a simple set here we initialize the set we are adding and we are testing whether one is in ds three is not in ds right 
we know that it is supposed to succeed because one was added here and here we are saying that 3 is not in ds yes it will say that and even when it comes to bloom filter it's not going to be very different from your solution wise you will once you initialize the data structure rest of the code doesn't matter whether it is bloom filter or a set you keep doing if, if you go pick a templatization or a virtual uh, table the rest of the code doesn't matter change this is how simple and elegant this is going to be of course the underlying math is all hidden under the bloom filter data structure implementation and even that too is not too complicated as we have just discussed okay but one thing that i must tell you is when we are initializing bloom filter it is parameterized unlike a set okay what it means is we need to say upfront say that we, we are not going to say infinite number of elements are going to come you should always give me uh, satisfy these tests no what we do is we further go and approximate depending on the kind of application that you're building if it is a url check guy then the guy knows that he need to size the bit vector to few billion elements to accommodate few billion elements or if it is an internet scale one they may need to accommodate few trillion elements there is a trade off okay and another beautiful thing is error rate okay why is there an error rate because when we when it says that it is there it may not be there which essentially means what it the, what data structure came back and told us is not necessarily true all right so that is what the error rate is but we need to remember that when it says it is not there 100 percent sure it's not there okay so now let us look into uh, just uh, as a curious uh, mary let us say what wikipedia says about the bloom filter this is how it defines it okay it defines it using the proper scientific terminology like false positives and false negatives so i thought it i took the opportunity to introduce this terminology this is a space efficient one which essentially means it's going to work and offer what it needs to offer with minimal amount of space it's not going to grow like a set or a traditional data structure and it also says that false positive matches are possible it's not guaranteed there's no guarantee okay but false negatives are not okay which in other words what it says is when it says it is there it's possibly there in the set but when it says it is not there it's definitely not there in the set could be slightly confusing but i think we have gone through it number of times okay so that is where the probability is coming into picture okay when we say false positives i mean how much of them are false positives so let us do a quick investigation i have put together a simple code to just investigate so that it it, it reveals a little more runtime behavior of this particular data structure i have done it just with the bloom filter but i can update the github with uh, for other data structures also if if students would want a jump start to investigate it further i just pick these terms and this is what i wanted to analyze space efficient that means i need to i will watch i will keep adding more and more and then observe whether the the memory is growing and i will also do uh, certain tests and start measuring false positives as well as false negatives and let us suppose let us see what happens when we keep adding more and more items and the definition also says that when more items are added the probability of false positives is going to increase let us just do a quick experiment and see how the program will match the definition this is how we do uh, uh, scientific investigations all right so what i did i mean uh, uh, briefly the what code does is uh, it, it it initialized the bloom filter with a capacity of 100000 elements and error tolerance of 0 0.01 those are the parameters i fixed those parameters all through across all the experiments okay and population i instead of adding all in one shot i also iterate uh, and on each iteration i add uh, 10000 elements and take a snapshot i measure how much memory it has taken so far or what is the average latency and average number of uh, the false positives or not average the total number of false positives and etc this is how i investigate the code is there in github okay and initially when i initialized it with 100000 and 10000 in each iteration i'm going to insert i will be running around 10 iterations so that means at the end of every iteration i will measure measure the memory measure the time 
time and, and, and false positives, false negatives. Okay, this is the tabulated version of the data that I that the program captured. You can see that the the yellow the green line which is false positives remained flat. Okay. And flat not just flat, it remained at zero. Doesn't matter. Even when I added 10,000, 20,000, 40,000, 60,000, 80,000, it never mattered, right? So false positives always remained at zero. That means when it says false positive, it is for sure, okay? False neg sorry, false negative. That is true with false negative. When it comes to false positive, I started actually when I do a false a test and then confirm whether it is there or not. That's how I counted. Uh, how many times does it fail? We can see that there is a slight increase in the trend. So that means false positives are increasing as we start adding more number of elements to the set. That's exactly what the, the Wikipedia also defines it as. Okay. And this red line is nothing but how much time am I going to take uh, to insert all those uh, 10,000 elements in each iteration. Let's not worry about those small uh, spikes are, are going up and down. That is typically the, how internal memory management and heap management happens. But what matters is more or less it remained flat. Flat as in it remained at around 0.9. It doesn't matter whether it is an MB or whatever. Right? So now what I did is I increased the number of iterations, which essentially means the capacity is still 100,000. So now I added 10,000 elements at a time, but I add, I ran 20 number of iterations. So we see that again, the false negatives remained flat and zero. Time that it took, doesn't matter how many I had added, time almost remained flat. That's an ideal case. We don't want the time to grow along with data. But the trade-off is unlike a traditional set, false positives have started increasing as we can see this blue line. Right? Let us investigate it a little further and, and take it to a conclusion. Okay. Is, it, if it, is it going to increase forever? Let us see. Just an investigation. So now earlier cycle I ran 10 iterations, 20 iterations, now I ran 100 iterations. Now those characteristics, time and false negatives remained flat. False negatives remained at zero. But the false positives, as you see, it increased initially. It was very steep. The growth was high initially but it started bending okay that means it's not going to go very steep let us do few more iterations and see what happens here is the aha moment right so beyond a point it has become flat and it's not flat but it is it started approaching 100 it will not i doubt if it will ever match or, or hit 100 percent but it started approaching the growth is very slow now you no know, for for some reduction or for uh, in, reduction of the probability we need to put a lot more than what we did initially right so this is a quick uh, investigation through a, 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 a simple program this is the summary what did we do with bloom filter we understood that bloom filter can help us with membership test and false negatives are uh, certain false positives are not certain error rate can be controlled and we fixed the capacity error tolerance, whereas we started increasing the iterations from 10 to 1000 and we started observing various parameters as experiment unfolds. The critical observations are insert time remained more or less constant. It never bothered about how many are already there because at the end of it, 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 it it's the same number of hash functions and it is the same bit vector being set. There is no reason why it should ever bother how many are already set. And insertion and query are exactly similar. Symmet just that in case of query we don't update the bitmap that's it so but those, those are nothing but the same operations memory more or less remained flat up front there would have been some memory gained and that's it false positives remained zero and flat no matter how many we inserted false positives started growing to 100 but beyond a point of number as we, we need to add more and more data to push it towards 100 it is tending to 100 it's not reaching 100 okay the code is available at this GitHub location. You can look it up uh, for a reference uh, later. Feel free to reach out to me if, if you need any help. Okay. So we have spent enough time on Bloom filter because that lays the foundation and gives a taste of what probabilistic data structure means. Right. So it solves our, it addresses our problems of memory limits, 
latency limits but of course there is a trade off okay. for certain queries it's not very accurate okay unlike a deterministic data structure okay the second problem that we agreed upon to investigate is frequency we are done with membership and now frequency and as i said frequency is a fancy term for just counting now the set is not a uh, uh, pure set it, let us suppose it is a multi set now the question is not just about whether this guy was seen before or not now the question is how many times have i seen him right this is slightly different version of that what do i need to do that i need to track the counts right so that's exactly what it is so now this is a multi set as you can observe one has repeated twice uh, two also has repeated twice 9 8 3 5 remain only once in the system set okay so now the question is going to be slightly different the question is how many times is the element x seen in it's just a uh, extension of the previous question as last time in bloom filter we said did i see it ever it's mostly like boolean okay but now it's not boolean it is quantifier right now we are saying how many times did i see okay just if you want to say you never saw it it has to be zero right so now let us suppose if the probe was done for an element 1 so it means one was seen twice this is what we want right so three was seen twice where a seven was never seen 10 also was never seen so it doesn't matter even if x belongs to it or doesn't belong to it it has to answer the question at the same time if had if we had probed the data structure with an element 8 it would have come back it should come back and tell us one that is the expectation and as we did for the bloom filter when it comes to the interface design for this data structure we don't blow it up with all fancy things only two things we should be able to add we should be able to query for the count as simple as it we are not going to retrieve or we are not going to ask the guy to dump all the elements present no we are not doing that all right so how does count mean sketch looks under the hood it looks very similar to the uh, uh, bloom filter that we did but it has more dimensions okay it is it's going to take a little more space okay so there we actually exhort all the hash values and and kept on setting same exact registers in those bit array but here we will not do that exhort what we do instead is we will maintain we will these cells are not bits let us assume these cells are numbers okay a bit essentially means only one bit but it depend if if you have to say it is number depending on how big the count is going to be it can either be a 32 bit integer or a 64 bit integer or what not right we can optimize the space if we if we are depending on how many element or how many times we would want to count so that is the fundamental difference we have an array of arrays here and each cell of the array unlike in bloom filter it is a number here it is not just a bit okay so what we do is like bloom filter given an element we are going to do n the d number of hashes here right so we use the same terminology w as the width that is the uh, the vector width depth is nothing but the number of hashes okay. so how does it work what is the mechanism under the hood now let us Talk about the operation. Add to the set. Let us suppose I have given x. Okay. Remember, x doesn't necessarily need to be a number, string, color. Doesn't matter. Hash doesn't just care. It hash treats it as just a bit stream and then hashes it to fix a number of bits. Okay. So just I'm picking numbers for uh, the sake of simplicity. Okay. So what we do when we the add operation, what it does is like in the Bloom filter, it's going to generate a number of hash values for that. now is the difference compared to the bloom filter in bloom filter we used to set the bit okay at this stage it also looks like setting the bit but actually what is happening under the hood is incrementing okay it's incremented so zero became one at this stage we wouldn't know if we are setting bit or not but that's what is happening so now let us suppose we added x again going back this is the first time we added it resulted in a hash uh, combination we though assuming those bits were zero at that point let us suppose we started fresh so we bump we incremented the number by 1 so now we increment it by 1 again okay because it is the same x hashes are consistent they yield the same result 
so they it's going to hit the same exact positions so when they are incremented they become twos right so now is the magic let us suppose the query or our or a new element y came into the system right so y is different from x it's not necessary unless there is a collision it's going to produce the same exact hash value so as a consequence let us suppose it produced different bits okay so it produced a fresh bit so that particular position the h0 got incremented one same is here here earlier x had already set it to two but this did not yield a bit at that particular position so we we left it unattended okay but there is a collision here this particular bit collided no matter we just incremented the number we so the two became three and here it is a fresh bit so became one so now it might give a brief idea of what's going on under the hood the magic is yet to be unfolded okay so now let us suppose someone asked us or the data probe the data structure saying tell me how many teams how many times have you seen x right like in bloom filter it, it does exactly same operations it's going to compute all the hash functions and then like in bloom filter this time it will not update instead it will count or it will extract the values these are counters or we can say accumulators it will extract those individual cells it will not update the bitmap so what happened here x yielded these bit positions like it was done in the initially after we added x twice and we added y after that so pick up all the counts here 2 2 3 2 two from the first hash function or or vector vectors again two from the second vector three from third vector and two from the last vector at those bit positions so now the data structure says the frequency is nothing but the minimum of those counters okay so the minimum of those is nothing but the 2 and we know that's what we added x twice right so though one of the bit has gone up to 3 the majority the 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 2 is majority and it dominated and the minimum value is 2 so so we got the count okay this is how the count mean sketch works okay same thing let's suppose we did y right we know that y was added only once and it still yields the expected result right this is how this uh, the, the data structure does the wonder this is a very elegant extension to the bloom filter they added the concept of counting and now it solves a, again a huge problem like in bloom filters the memory is fixed you don't have to keep increasing it the increments happen for a different reason okay the online data structures live data structure on the fly, on the fly if there are overflows if you want to reorganize data and, and bump up the capacity those are the reasons but once you fixed the capacity memories don't grow and also the time complexity is constant what more do we need so this is again a simple algorithm if you put it in that form so we we compute hashes we add it earlier we did an xor here we are adding and same thing we do we check and then return the minimum of those values this is how the count mean sketch will work okay and like in uh, bloom filter even the 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 count mean sketch is going to look very sorry i i put csk it is supposed to be cm uh, s it's going to look very simple and elegant once you initialize the uh, data structure rest of the flow is uh, the, the flow is very same it has it you can add it it just so happens that in python the counter adds elements by plus whereas here the function is add but net net the semantics are same right this is how the uh, count mean sketch can help us count things or it addresses the frequency problem very elegantly with a fixed amount of memory and fixed number of cycles for both insertion as well as query so here is the uh, uh i would say hero of all of these the hyper log log here we will not discuss it in in as in detail as we did for count mean sketch and uh, bloom filter here things get little more complicated visual representations are uh, difficult it involves estimations like at logarithmic level 
but net net what is the problem that it addresses right given a set let us suppose we keep adding the we should be able to add and then the query can come in the form of saying how many distinct elements were seen in the set it's as simple as it but at the same time again it shouldn't be growing in memory or or the latency should not grow as data is inserted okay so let us directly jump into the program this is as simple as it looks now doesn't matter whether you're pumping a million or billion this guy can still stand up and take whereas the set could get blown up to consuming few gigs of memory and and increasing latency but hll will stand still i mean it it just consumes fixed amount of memory and it can keep answering you and hll is even more beautiful i mean you can do lot of uh, set operations like unions intersections which we couldn't do on uh, the uh, of course we can do uh, bloom filters also we can we can uh, form the union so hll gets even more fancier as it supports most of the set operations okay and now uh, i think we have spent around one hour uh, since it's a online webinar uh, i was told there are close to 1000 people so q and a is not possible online uh, here are the links uh, you can uh, feel free to go to github uh, i have put uh, i have shared the code snippets there feel free to uh, even branch off or, or if you want to make changes you do that if you want some assistance please reach out to me you can mail me on uh, this uh, address venkatababji.sama@gmail and this is just my profile on the research gate okay so with this uh, i would conclude thanks to all of you uh, for listening to uh, this presentation patiently in case there are if in case uh, i happen to uh, uh, go over certain topics uh, faster than you could uh, catch or if there were any confusions please reach out uh, but when you when you send a mail please send it with uh, pds as the uh, you leave that word in the subject i can i can uh, take a look at them and respond to that thank you once again to all the audience and the organizers for uh, facilitating this have a good day